It is perhaps appropriate that the team which leads the way as we enter the third year of the new millennium is a side which has embraced and refined the new professionalism, albeit allied to the traditional virtues of hardness and team spirit, a team which encompasses both the traditional and the modern. Very effective again, Rod Caper. Johnson through! To compete in the Zurich Premiership in the modern era, every player in the side must be of international quality. There is no room for weakness. To guarantee this quality, it is necessary not only to cherry-pick from the best of the Six Nations teams, but also to attract, if you can, the stars of the Southern Hemisphere. Leicester Tigers have now won the Premiership a remarkable four years in succession. More than anyone, they embody this new attitude to the game, a far more hard-nosed approach, a necessary evil when faced with the realities of financial survival in a competitive marketplace. But what would the original rugby players have made of these modern rugby mercenaries? How would they have coped with rugby's increasing specialisation, the modern giants of the pack? Every decade has had its great teams, its great players. And of course the changes in the game make it difficult to gauge how the teams compare. Which were the greatest sides? Was it the Southern Hemisphere sides of the early part of the century? The All Black teams of 1905 or 1925? What about the great South African teams from 1906 onwards? They didn't lose a test series until 1956. The arguments go on and on. Well, the international sides, I think the one that made the biggest impact on me as a youngster, I suppose, was the um, 67 All Blacks, um, who I thought were just, just moved the game on. And, and uh, that, was, that was a tremendous team. Um, just as I think then, when you got into the 70s, I, you know, I think British sides were, were definitely the best in the world at the time. The 71 Lions, uh, the Welsh team of the 70s, I think, was an outstanding team. The 74 Lions, uh, you know, a great team to play in. And, and the records of these teams over a long period, uh, I think, was, um, was exceptional. Uh, but certainly the... Um, you know, the Australian team of 84 uh, that came here and did the, the Grand Slam, I thought was a, was a very good side. And uh, latterly, I think the, the All Black side that evolved after the 87 World Cup probably played its best rugby in Australia in 88. But that, again, I believe moved the game on to another level. And, uh, uh, the Australians of, of 1991, I think, did as well. So you, you have teams that, I think, push the game and, and, and move it on each decade. Rugby, by its nature, is a game which demands a mixture of courage, athleticism and skill. Great under pressure, if you like, and certainly it claims one of the most romantic births of any sport. It's a lovely story. In 1823, a 16-year-old boy at rugby school William Webb Ellis was playing soccer. Apparently, he either picked up or caught the ball and started to run forward with it, thereby instigating the game of rugby. The truth is more complicated. In the 1870s, when rugby was exploding nationally, it was the first time that internationals were played, it was really growing as a sport. And the old boys at rugby school decided to look into the history of their game and to find out where and when it started. And they, uh, they asked all the old boys from rugby school to write in, giving ideas and memories. And one boy mentioned, one well, boy, he was been a boy at the time, but he was now about 80 years old, and his memory might not have been 100%. He wrote back saying, my brother can remember being at school with a chap called Webb Ellis, who ran with the ball, but I'm not quite sure. And it was all a bit hazy. That was the only name they were given, and that's the reason they, that the Webb Ellis myth grew. In actual fact, the story is much more interesting. Um, in the 1820s, 1830s, uh, the students at rugby school, the boys, used to play football, as it was known. And they played a game of football which had its own rules. 
which were made up as they went along to an extent. After each game, we hear that um, the senior boys would actually stand to one side and discuss the game that had been played and decide the rules for the next day. So it was a very uh, flexible game. And it's quite possible that during that period, running with the ball was tried. Um, Jen Mackey, in the late 1830s, we know for a fact, did run with the ball in his hands. And he actually touched over the goal line. And he was probably the first person to score what we now know as a try. So if anything, he deserves credit for, um, I mean, it should be the Jen Mackey World Cup, not the Webb Ellis World Cup. Prior to its evolution at rugby school, rugby was essentially football, which itself evolved from other earlier activities. It is, of course, almost impossible to be completely accurate about the origins of football, as mankind has been kicking balls or objects around since history began. But where did that mayhem end and an actual game begin? If we look back to China, for instance, we find an ancient Chinese version of football, and the Romans had a version of football called harpastum, which they brought over to the British Isles when they invaded in the first century AD. So that was the first time that football codes came over to Britain. And it then it fragmented and was played in different forms all around the country. It was basically a rabble of people fighting for a ball. Um, during medieval times, a ball like this would have been used, um, leather encased with straw or hay or feathers inside it. Um, archery practice was felt to be very important for national defence. And from the 14th to 17th centuries, footballs, and in, indeed most sports, were actually banned because it was, they were taking away um, people's attention from archery practice. In pre-industrial Britain, there were traditional encounters between two villages, where one team would endeavour to move a ball from one village, or field, to the next, with the inevitable jollity and injury. But the mass production of the Industrial Revolution demanded that the workforce move into work centres, into towns, and this kind of undisciplined mob mayhem was discouraged. In public schools, games served other purposes. An adolescent's physical energy was channelled into organised activity. Rugby was violent and aggressive, but also controlled. The headmaster at rugby school, just after the so-called Webb Ellis period, when rugby football was developing rules, was Thomas Arnold. At the time, you have to remember that all the different public schools played their own version of football. So you had Winchester football, Harrow football, Eton football, and so forth. Um, what Arnold did was he came into rugby school as headmaster and he brought a concept with him of muscular Christianity. It involved looking after your fellow man, um, team spirit, physical contact, hard work, and of course a, a, a sound Christian moral upbringing. And it was picked up upon and spread around the country by other public schools. So you had Cheltenham College, Marlborough College picking up on the model and also taking the code of rugby football with them. So Cheltenham College football and Marlborough College football disappeared as rugby football came in. And this is essentially how rugby football spread around the country to the different public schools. Also at rugby school at the same time you had um, the, the schoolboys wearing white. And that's why England wear white. It, that was picked up upon as a tradition. Also to differentiate between the different houses as they played against each other at rugby school, they were awarded coloured caps for their house. And that again is where the idea of getting an international cap derives from. So many, many of the concepts and the ideas of that are currently involved in rugby football derive from rugby school. Once the rugby boys left their school and went to university, they sometimes found that other boys from other schools played under other rules. Even today, Winchester School plays its own version of football. This problem had to be addressed. A chap called Pell in the 1830s was trying to organise football games at, at um, Cambridge University. Couldn't do so, found it very difficult because of all these different rules. Therefore, in the 1840s, and then more successfully in the 1860s, he wrote a set of rules to be played as national football. These were taken, these Cambridge rules, by, at the first meeting of the Football Association, which was formed in 1863 in London. They took the Cambridge rules and said, this is the set of rules we're going to use to govern football nationally. At that meeting were representatives from numerous clubs, including Blackheath, who of course are a rugby club, as we know them today. Blackheath weren't happy with a couple of aspects of the rules. Hacking and tripping, throttling, they really like to keep. We don't know why, but this is some, because actually they dropped them a couple of years later from their own rules, so it's a bit of a strange thing. The Football Association were happy to keep running with the ball, but Blackheath were adamant that they wanted to keep hacking and tripping, which the FA didn't want. Blackheath walked out of the meeting, the, the FA were formed, and they didn't have running with the ball because Blackheath took it with them. If Blackheath had stayed in that meeting, who knows what might have happened. Football, or soccer as we know it now, might include running with the ball in the arms. 
also the RFU would never have been formed. Rugby would never exist, perhaps. The rules and even the vocabulary of football tell us a lot about how the game has evolved. Why do rugby players kick the ball over the posts instead of into them? Why are touchdowns called tries? Initially, the players tried to score a goal from open play. You would kick into the posts from as far away as you could. As you progress towards a post, sometimes you got to the goal line and you may have to go over the goal line, which made it very difficult to kick into the post, obviously. You would put the ball down, which would give you the opportunity to then try to score a goal. So in early days, in the, the first England match, 1871, England lost to Scotland by one try to one try and one goal, because we got the try but we missed the goal. Um, so right up to the 1870s, this was a way of scoring. Um, the evolution of the goal posts, it's a, it's a bit hazy, but from what we can gather, the goal originally was as other football codes, like soccer, whereby you had to go into the goal, you scored the goal into it. Um, at rugby school, they used the junior boys as goalkeepers because it gave them, A, a chance to learn the rules of the game, and B, an involvement, which didn't involve getting actually in the middle of the melee and getting killed, because they were so small. So they would give them the job as being goalkeepers to learn the rules. And it took about three months to learn the rules. Um, because they were goalkeepers, it became very difficult to score goals through the goal. This is what we've been told. And so eventually they changed the rules. It was all very flexible. They changed the rules to go over the bar. That was to score the goal, not into it. It became so difficult to score through all the goalkeepers. As mentioned, the first rugby international took place in March 1871, England against Scotland. This was a 20-a-side game. It wasn't until 1875 that the 15-a-side format was adopted at the universities, and another two years before it was seen in an international. As rugby developed into more of a passing as opposed to a kicking game, the ball the game was played with also changed. Initially, the size of the ball was dictated by the size of the pig, who supplied the bladder. This pig's bladder was then encased in leather. At first, the emphasis was on kicking goals. You scored more points for kicking the goal than the try. At that time, the spherical shape of the bladder suited this rugby kicking game. But as passing developed and back play increased, it was felt important to develop a more streamlined shape. Now, what happened was that in the 1850s, a chap called Linden was making balls um, and he used to employ his wife to inflate the pig's bladders by mouth with a tube. Unfortunately, one day she inhaled by mistake. She, c she contracted an awful um, lung disease and died. This gave him the impetus to go out and invent a rubber bladder, which could go into the balls. Therefore, by having that, you could, you could regulate the size and also, importantly, the shape. So that's where you get the modern streamlined shape, which everybody wanted to enable them to pass the ball more easily. So you go from the, rub from the pig's bladder to the rubber Ladder. The Rugby Football Union was formed in 1871. A number of London clubs got together to form an organisation to govern the game, protect its best interests and of field a national side. The game at this time was very popular, especially with the working man in the mills and countries of the north. For example, the York Cup in its early years used to attract more people to watch it, more spectators, than the FA Cup at that time, and also games played it in the Southland at Rugby Union. So you see there, that was the of the game. Now, to the extent, um, the RF and Centre, based in the South, certain, not discussed, but they feel comfortable with the rise of the North because the working class man more of a, a need to fight and victory or costs and local rivalries, whereas the game as they saw it in the South was more about um, the Arnold version of the game, muscular Christianity, um, bettering yourself, good sportsmanship. Victory wasn't to be won at all costs, it was about looking after your fellow man. And they felt there was a certain antagonism between the two codes. This came to a head when it was established in the north, especially with the working man, who had to take time off work on a Saturday to play the game. Um, he was asking his clubs in the north for broken time payment, which meant payment in lieu of hours lost from not being in his factory. Back in 1893, the Yorkshire Union's request for players to be compensated for broken time caused the first of many rucks off the field. And as they've done at the end of the 20th century, the first rulers of the RFU allowed this dispute to rumble on for some time, until in 1895, at a meeting at the George Hotel Huddersfield, 20 clubs from Yorkshire, Lancashire and Cheshire broke away to form the Northern Union. That Northern Union became Rugby League. Now, there's lots of debate about this. Some people say that it was purely a class struggle, that the RFU wanted to cut off the arm of working class support. 
other people will tell you that it's just about money, that they want it to be purely amateur. I think it's somewhere between the two because we have got reports of certain London clubs, I think Wasp has been named among them, who actually took tours of Northern England in that time and were paid to travel up north. So in a sense they were flouting the um, amateur ethos themselves. So really it is probably more to do with a class struggle to an extent than it was purely about payment. Just as the game had been taken up in the north of England, the same pattern emerged in Wales. But this time the game was harnessed to a national as opposed to a regional or class identity. In 1881 the Welsh Rugby Union was formed. But as opposed to England, rugby became a binding and not a divisive presence. From the late 1880s onwards, the Welsh style of play revitalised rugby, fostering a fluid running game allied to aggressive hard forwards. This was the forerunner of the modern passing game. Well, Arthur Gould was their, their big man. He was recognised to be probably the best centre three-quarter in the world. And he was the one who got them moving on the uh, four three-quarter line. And they carried all before them. And there was no question that they were the, the team to beat. In 1905, for example, the New Zealanders came over and beat everybody in sight, except when they went to Cardiff and they were beaten by Wales. Before that momentous 1905 game, Gould led Wales to their first Triple Crown victory in 1893. This was followed by six more between 1900 and 1911. But, in a sense, everything came together in 1905, the All Blacks tour. December the 16th, Wales 3, the All Blacks 0. This team, led by Gwyn Nichols, was a side that accommodated both working class and middle class players, plus immigrant Englishmen. In fact, a team of the future. If Gould was the prime mover in Welsh rugby, Adrian Stoop was the English Arthur Gould. But of course, there is Adrian Stoop, who was the captain of the England team against Wales in 1910. And although not generally recognised, is probably responsible for quite a lot of the way the game um, pattern changed. Well, he picked up on the Welsh idea of playing four three-quarters and the interpassing. And it was uh, noticeable that England played very much better after he'd done this than they had before. This is recognised by Harlequins, which was his club, in the fact that they have named their new ground after him, the Stoop Memorial Ground. Of course, the rules of the game are constantly evolving. Today's laws would prevent anyone, apart from a specialist forward, from packing down in the front three. But before 1905, anyone who arrived first would form the front row. The technical abilities of players like Federico Mendes would make this an almost criminal offence today, as the power of a Mendes could break a man in two. The game of rugby was taken abroad, to Europe, particularly France, but more importantly, to the Southern Hemisphere. As far as we're, we know, um, the way that rugby spread around the public schools of England is, is very similar to the way it spread around the world. This idea of the group play, fighting for each other, the team spirit, it was, it was seen as very important in that period generally. And we know that a lot of the ideas and traditions of rugby school went abroad with it, with the code. So for example you have the Southern Hemisphere nations awarding caps, just as they awarded caps for schoolhouses in rugby school. However, these things did disappear quite quickly. So by the 1920s, 1930s, caps had disappeared from the Southern Hemisphere and then started award awarding blazers, which were obviously much more useful and, and they weren't so decorative. So the traditions went with the code abroad, but they did slowly disappear as, as the, the countries themselves took on their own different traditions. Even more than in Wales, the game of rugby in New Zealand is seen as a gauge of the nation's strength and standing. Rugby is the sport of the country. It holds incredible importance and has been, in the main, a game of equal opportunity. In the late 19th century, rugby saw Maori playing alongside white New Zealander. The 1888 side that toured Britain was in fact called the Maoris. Only five of that side were white New Zealanders. The first official New Zealand tour was in 1905, one of the great sides of that era. Apart from their Welsh experience, they swept all before them, returning home as heroes. As in Wales, the game has become a unifying force, bonding both class and race. So much so that the famous native hacker has become a national institution, whites taking on the way of the Maori. Number 
it's certainly a frightening looking do altogether, isn't it? After the horror of the Boer War, the 1906 Springboks tour of Britain was almost as successful as that of the 1905 All Blacks. This was the dawn of a long era of dominance. Thereafter, the Springboks didn't lose a test series, either at home or abroad, until 1956. The clashes between the All Blacks and the Springboks became the unofficial championships of the world. The first official test series between the two took place in 1921. This series was drawn, but there had been earlier matches, even if they weren't recognised as internationals by the rugby union. In 1916, two forces sides had this contest at Richmond, England, under the watchful eye of the New Zealand High Commissioner, T. Mackenzie. The result of this match has never been uncovered. But rugby in South Africa was a reflection of its society. It was infused with racism. This was a white man's team in a white man's game. In 1919, the same New Zealand forces team seen here playing Leicester were invited to play in South Africa. They left one of their players, a West Indian, Reggie Wilson, on board ship. Although the game in New Zealand was seemingly free of racism, when it came to choose between international rugby or no international rugby, they bowed to the prejudices of the Springboks. As we have seen, rugby was becoming a global game, and Northern Hemisphere teams have always been keen to test their strength against the sides from the Southern Hemisphere. At the turn of the century, two new sides developed, the famous British Lions and the side which embodied the Corinthian spirit of the game, the Barbarians. The Lions tours have been one of the highlights of world rugby since their inception in 1888, with the first privately arranged tour to Australia and New Zealand. These early tours were populated by players who could afford to take up to six months off, university students or the sons of the wealthy. Well, people who could afford the time and the money. You know, you, you had to get all sorts of uh, clothes. You had to have white ties and tails and all that sort of thing to go to, to our dances, even in our tour. It was a very expensive thing from our point of view to go at all. A lot of people couldn't afford to go. The married men couldn't afford to go at all. We only had two married men on the tour. But, I mean, I was ready to give my job up to go. 1899 was the first tour to contain players from all four countries, and 1910, the first tour to represent the four home unions officially. Formed in 1890 by a group of Blackheath players, led by William Percy Cartmel, the Barbarians has always existed without a home ground, but has a place in the heart of every true fan. Rugby was prospering in every sense of the word. In 1910, a rugby ground was built on the outskirts of London, at Twickenham. This became the famous headquarters of English rugby, and eventually the towering structure that we know today. The first game at Twickenham featured Harlequins and Richmond. Quins won 14-10. Their team included two great players, Adrian Stoop, and Ronald William Poulton Palmer. The first international at Twickenham was England-Wales. England won 11-6, the first English victory since 1898. This team too included the influential Stoop and Poulton Palmer. Poulton Palmer was one of the many casualties of the Great War. You see, when the war broke out, the rugby union decreed and they sent a letter out to all clubs that everybody was to join the army and that rugby was to cease and so as a result flocks of, of uh, players joined up and the amount of, of uh, people lost was extreme. A typical example is in the last match played in 1914 between England and Scotland 12 players died, six uh, Scots and six English so there was a whole load who never came back. Amongst them, Poulton Palmer, of course. Uh, Poulton Palmer was the star three-quarter of England in those days. And he was killed 
1915 leading a, a, a raid. The interwar years, however, were an era of rugby prosperity, especially in England. In the 20s, more clubs were formed than in any other decade. As education became accessible, open to all, the middle classes formed old boys clubs. Rugby became the fashionable game for the educated middle class. <laughs> More players played the game than ever before. This was reflected in the success of the national team, who went on to win four Grand Slams in the 20s, including victory 10-6 against France in 1921, the first of their 1920s Grand Slams. And this win, 12-3 in Dublin against Ireland in 1922, in a year when, unusual in that decade, Wales beat England and took the championship. And victory in Swansea against the Welsh in 1924, another Grand Slam year for the English. Today's players like Neil Back would have had a field day in the 20s when England players like Captain Wavell Wakefield ruled the roost in the new system. Wakefield completely revolutionized back row play. He worked out that if the back row swung the scrum round to whichever side he wanted, then the back row would be in front of the three quarters. And provided they had the ball, they could then move forward. And this is what they did. And there was nothing to stop them. All they had was two or three three quarters who happened to be on that side, able to try and tackle them. And with the numbers they had, it was a piece of cake and they won two Grand Slams that way. And it wasn't till later that they tightened the laws up to preclude uh, the scrum moving more than 90 degrees, which it is now, and further, that uh, the back row had to hold on to the other players. They were quite free to break any time they wished. In Scotland, in rugby terms at least, they mirrored the English trends. They too had fine teams in the 20s and 30s. They lost to England in 1925, but took the championship. In 1927, they shared the championship with Ireland, despite losing here in Dublin. In Wales, where the game was based far more amongst the working class than in England, the game suffered during the Depression years. The national team hardly won a game in this period, and English superiority reigned. But even in the 1920s, the Southern Hemisphere were leading the way. In 1924-25, the All Blacks toured Britain with devastating effect. They took revenge for their 1905 defeat by beating Wales 19-0. They were too good for a strong English side too challenging them with the traditional hacker before beating them 17-11, despite being reduced to 14 players. The match was apparently a violent one. Cyril Brownlee, the All Black, became the first player to be sent off at Twickenham, supposedly for punching an opponent. The All Blacks finished the tour undefeated. But the Southern Hemisphere sides were not only creating stronger players, they were pioneering new formats and rule changes. The Springboks of that era developed the 3-4-1 setup in the scrum, the forebear of today's packs, although at the time the Kiwis made do with two in the front row. When New Zealand went to South Africa for the 1928 series, they packed 2-3-2, an obvious disadvantage. If, if, if you're packing like that, 2-3-2, uh, you, you've never got the loose head. And uh, this chap, when the ball's put in, this fellow's nearer to the side to the putting it in. But he's also got it that side of the scrum, which meant they, meant they had the loose head, uh, whichever side the ball was put in. Well, what New Zealand did then was uh, say, right, uh, Ron Stewart, one of the big forwards in the, in the New Zealand team, he went loose head, and he, what he did, he, 
waited to see which side the ball was being put in, and he, he f ran from behind here to, to whichever side the ball was being put in. So that, the, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, wherever, wherever he went, uh, he made the loose head for, for South Africa, for New Zealand. He, he, if he went that side, he was nearer the ball than this chap. And if he went the other side, he was nearer the ball than the loose head the other side, which is pretty... New Zealand then drew that series 2-2 against uh, South Africa. The Springboks against the All Blacks was always the heavyweight contest and always controversial. For that 1928 series, two great Maori players, George Napier and Jimmy Milne, were left behind. Napier had been one of the stars of the phenomenal touring team of 1924, but rather than rock the boat, he was omitted from the party. In France during the 1920s, rugby prospered, but despite the growing strength of the game, it took until 1927 for them to defeat England, and even longer to defeat Wales. Shamaterism prospered. Players were helped out by their clubs, with expenses, food at restaurants, the best jobs. At club level, the Federation responded by banning some of their leading players. The British rugby authorities, however, unconvinced by this stance, broke off relations with France in 1931. The 30s was not a good era for the England team, for a number of reasons. Of course, the selection was ad hoc. You decided yourself, we had big selection committees, who, as you're well aware, committees don't always agree. A player was selected, if he had a bad game, he was dropped. And someone else took his place. If he had a bad game, he was dropped. And perhaps the first one would come back again. And that's how it went on. And they just uh, played as individuals. No coaching, nobody to tell them what to do, no game plan. In South Africa, two dominant figures emerged. Firstly, August Marcotter, who selected the 1931 touring team to Great Britain. It's 19 years since the last rugger team came over from South Africa, so we're glad to see them, and may they have great sport on their tour. Sitting on the left there is Tyndall, the full back. Next to him is J.C. van der Westhuizen, vice-captain. Then Benny Osler, the skipper. He seems rather shy. And the two this team included a 21-year-old scrum half called Darnie Craven, a man who was later to dictate the direction of South African rugby. De Villiers and Craven, scrum halves, Van Merwe forward, and Venter wing three-quarter, who weighs 13 stone eight. Heavy for a three, but he's fast with it. The 1931 Springboks beat all the four home nations, and convincingly. In the mid-1930s, Wales' fortunes revived, due in no small part to the emergence of grammar schools dedicated to rugby football, and thus a new generation of talent, especially in the backs. They also didn't have the British selection problems. Part of the reason for this was the fact that the Welsh, being a smaller nation, got together, they played in teams where they, everybody knew each other. There weren't the number of teams to pick from, you see. There was only, what, 140 odd Welsh teams altogether. There was over five or 600 teams in England in the 30s. In 1933, the Welsh team won at Twickenham for the first time. From their first game there in 1910, they suffered a string of eight defeats and one draw in 1931. This 7-3 victory in 1933 put an end to that bogey. In 1935, the All Blacks returned. The All Blacks are here again. British rugger teams, beware. They're after your blood. The famous New Zealand rugby team are in training at Newton Abbott, and our camera catches them showing exactly how forward movement should be done, while their manager, Mr. V.R. Meredith, looks on. On the right, the captain, J. Manchester. We wish him and his team the best of luck. On a frosty winter afternoon at Cardiff Arms Park, a crowd of 50,000 is waiting to see whether Wales, for so many years a power in British rugger, can make any impression on this year's only once beaten All Blacks. 30 years ago, this ground saw Wales beat that season's touring New Zealanders. So at any rate, the home team have history behind them. And at the interval, it's New Zealand three points, Wales naught. 
But it's the second half that is sensational, that puts every man jack in the crowd right up on his toes. Told by the score, the story is that Wales score a try, convert, and are two points up. Within five minutes, they score and convert again. Seven points up. Fighting like demons, New Zealand's Gilbert taps a goal. Wales only three points up. New Zealand score and convert again. Now they lead by two points. Then Rhys Jones of Wales is over again. And a 30-year-old Welsh victory is repeated by 13 points to 12. After losing to Wales, the All Blacks went to Twickenham. At Twickenham, for 70,000 Raga fans, it's the high spot of the season when England come out for their first international match against the All Blacks. England is playing in white. And standing in the middle is Obolensky, destined to play such a great part in this match. Many at first thought the All Blacks unbeatable, but their recent whacking by Wales have given England new hope. And that was a one-off. No one team. quite knows how. Um, they played above themselves. Everybody played well on the day, and the following match, they, they didn't play at all well, but they played very well on that day, plus the fact that the Prince Oblensky was an unusual player. Prior to the in international, he played for Oxford University against New Zealand and had run round their fullback and scored a try. When they came to Twickenham, he did precisely the same thing. The result, of course, was that the New Zealanders were on the watch for him. The second time he had the ball, everybody moved to the right. But England do put up a good show. Merely for turned the first left and went into the left hand corner, almost unopposed. Mostly unopposed. in midfield. And then Obolensky steps right into the picture with a magnificent demonstration. From a scrum, the ball goes out to the three quarters. Obolensky takes it from Gerard, going like a racehorse. He sweeps round and touches down 10 yards from the post. Dunkley takes the kick, but it hits the crossbar. England three up. Within a few minutes, Obolensky does it again. This time he gets the ball from Cranmer and cuts right across to the left corner flag, putting England six up. And the match ends magnificently by England winning by 13 points to naught. Uh, so I uh, wanted to see what these tries were, because I'd be up against it and uh, playing against it the following Saturday. Uh, so I went uh, to a news flick place in the Strand. I paid a shilling, sat down, and the two tries came, boom, boom, like right quickly, three minutes. I thought I'm going to see those again. I stayed in another hour. I said, oh, all these awful cartoons, I had to wait for them to go through to see it again. And I stayed there for four hours, I say, to see this thing four times. Throughout this era, New Zealand and South Africa were now accepted as the two best teams in the game. The 1933 series in New Zealand between the two rivals was seen as the championship of the world. In the event, South Africa triumphed two games to one to establish their dominance. In 1938, the Lions team had to go to South Africa to take on these giants. They had just come back and been hailed as the finest team ever to leave New Zealand it was the 1937 Springboks, they mm -hmm. all said, you see. But Donnie Clavin was the vice captain in, in uh, New Zealand, he's captain against us. So we had to play them. Uh, Immediately afterwards, they, they, they came back from New Zealand in 37, and we had to play them in 1938. So they were a very hot side. The Lions lost the first two tests, but triumphed in the third and final game of the series. It was a magnificent second half rally by Torres. Recovery after interview were 13 three, three down at half time. And you know, we thought we were going to get that. But the second half, we scored 18 points to their three. And a marvellous uh, second half from our point of view. Uh, and uh, we were a very popular team, touring team. We, well, this time they knew all our players. They, the crowd rushed on and they carried our Sammy Walker captain off the field, you know, they shoulder high and all that sort of thing. During the 40s, sport understandably took second place to the World War. 
Five Nations Games were suspended from 1939 to 1947. But on their resumption in 1947, the championship was shared by England and Wales. Welsh rugby 15 in dark shorts gain a 3 0 surprise victory over France. Watch Wales stop another effort by the Frenchman. Moving from back to centre, Newport's Ken Jones, letter B, gets away with a ball. Hitherto unbeaten, France may not now head the international championship table after all. The Wales Island clash and the England France match will decide who's to be the premier rugby team. The four countries have an even chance. Cloudy Farms Park, the white shorted Wallabies kick off before a 40,000 crowd in the last match of their tour. With the Barbarians as opponents, the Australians are unable to lay the Cardiff bogey. From ex printer Cyril Holmes, number 11, comes the home side's first try Edinburgh Steel Bodger touching down. Since 1948, touring sides to the British Isles have always ended their tour with the game against the Barbarians. In 1948, the Barbars instigated the tradition of including one uncapped player for their game against the Wallabies at the Cardiff Arms Park. The Wallabies equalise with a Tonkin penalty, which hits the post and bounces over. But the home side is unbeatable. A third try comes from a Turner pass to Hayden Tanner, and the Australians go down by 9 to 6. Field, South Africa, in dark jerseys, kicked off against Scotland in the 13th match of their tour, which was bad luck for Scotland. The Scots attacked early on and for 17 minutes held their own. In fact, they nearly scored first. 1951-52 saw the visit of another Titanic Springboks team to the British Isles. This was a Scottish side that hadn't won the championship since 1938, but the result was still an embarrassment. A defensive slip gave Muller a chance, and he scored. A converted try by Latigan made it 39-0. Then Dinkelman fought through the score on the post, and with Geffen's aid, made the final score 44-0. England kick off at Twickenham, where the Springboks suffered their only defeat of the tour against London counties, and right from the start it's evident that it's going to be a hard game. Oxy tackles Woodward. He's playing a ripping game. And Woodward showing plenty of form. Yeah, plenty. He'll need a new pair of bags. There'll be a slight interval for him to adjust his dress. The Springboks lead 5-3 at halftime. England are doing much better than expected. And in the second half, the Springboks are still in danger. A penalty settled the issue. Muller takes the kick. The ball goes in off to give South Africa victory by eight points to three and a clean sweep in the international. These were a good few years for the Welsh team. In 1950, they won the championship, seen here beating England 11-5 at Twickenham. In 1952, they won the Grand Slam. And in 1954, both Cardiff and the national team defeated the All Blacks. Cardiff in striped shirts kick off against the so far unbeaten All Blacks at Cardiff Arms Park. Spurred on by the roar of 56,000 of their countrymen, the Welshmen are soon giving the New Zealanders something to think about by keeping up a solid attack. Thomas gets it to teammate Rowlands. Rowlands' cross kick goes under the goal and starts a wild scramble. The Cardiff forwards join in the fray, and finally the ball reaches the hands of Sid Judd, who bundles over for the first touchdown. The All Blacks kick off against Wales at Cardiff Arms Park, straight into a dazzling sun that won't help them much in this rugby classic. Now for some of the stuff that 56,000 people have come to see. Brisk, bustling attacking by the New Zealanders, and stubborn do-or-die defence by the Welshmen. Thomas punts it across the field, where Ken Jones is ready and waiting. Jones has it safe and sound, and over he goes. A perfect touchdown that gives Wales a solid lead in the last few minutes of the match. Rowlands takes the conversion. Two more points for Wales. There's no further score, so Wales have done it by 13 points to eight. 
This was, however, an all-black side that was good enough to beat England, Ireland, Scotland and the Barbarians. Now New Zealand and Davis passes to Guy Bowers and away goes the 20-year-old Old Black racing for the Irish line. A perfectly timed pass finds Richard White. Bob Stewart receives and over he goes to touchdown. Ten minutes after half-time, a penalty gives the All Blacks a chance of scoring. Bob Scott takes it. New Zealand three points in the lead, are full of confidence now. But towards the end of the second half, there's another anxious moment for Scotland as the All Blacks dive for the corner with Haig leading the rush. But he touches down just short of the line and New Zealand, with a narrow win by three points to nil, adds Scotland to their list of victories. So far, there's not a lot to choose between the teams. They're both playing hard and fast. Along the Barbarians line to Griffiths, who, like Quicksilver, darts through the All Blacks defenders for a perfect touchdown right between the posts. The conversion is no problem for King. Sixteen five to the All Blacks. No conversion for that one. Only two minutes left and Dixon passes to McCaw. As McCaw goes down, he slips it to White who dives over for yet another. With the final score at 19 points to five, the All Blacks, one of the finest and most popular teams ever to visit this country, end their triumphant tour. In 1955, the Lions visited South Africa under the leadership first of Irish lock Robin Thompson and latterly Cliff Morgan. The series was square, but the highlight of the tour was the historic first test at Johannesburg. Deep passes to Morgan. With the line underway, Davis gives the ball to Butterfield. Butterfield rips the defence wide open before giving out a pet who goes over in the corner for an unconverted try. Springbok captain Stephen Fry passes to Beers, who's over in the corner for a converted try, and South Africa leads 11-3. Only two minutes left before half-time, Butterfield has it. He dummies and puts in a brilliant run to score between the posts a magnificent try. With Morgan knifing his way through the defence for a try. Cameron converted, and the Lions have regained the lead by 13 points to 11. There was more to come when Morgan sent the kick upfield. Jackman escaped, misjudged it, and O'Reilly following up gathered and went for the line. O'Reilly, however, was brought down a matter of inches short, but his teammate Greenwood kicked forward and scored. This was converted, and another goal gave the Lions a lead of 23-11. The Springboks were back within striking distance, and here comes the strike. Elliot is grass, but Sinclair backs him up. Sinclair has it, and from a scramble, the ball comes out to Beers on the wing, and Beers goes over to make the score 23-22. What a last-minute situation. And a terrific strain from the Scaife takes the deciding kick. It goes astray, and the British Isles have won the first test by 23 points to 22. The 50s were a good era for the English, too. Championship victories in 1953 and 1954 were followed by the Grand Slam in 1957. Scotland in dark shirts kick off against England in the last rugby international of the season. And it's a determined side they're fighting, for an English victory will make a clean sweep of the Calcutta Cup, the International Championship and the Triple Crown. Not long to go now, and the powerful English scrum are really on top of the game. Right in front of the post, they heal to scrum half Jeeps, who's pulled down. A quick scramble, but standoff Bartlett is there, and he gets it away to Higgins. And it's over the line for the final try, clinching England's three-in-one victory. What a finish to the season. The English team followed this by taking the championship in 1958. If Wales and England were strong in the 50s, so too were the French. In 1954, they shared the five nations for the first time, and in 1958, they became the first team this century to win a test series in South Africa. In 1959, they finally won the Five Nations Championship outright for the first time, despite losing to Ireland in Dublin. This match of the season against the champions, France. President O'Kelly greeted the teams and the big crowd were keyed up to expect a great match. Playing left to right in this picture, Ireland kicked off. The right centre, M.K. Flynn, bamboozled the French defence, passed to Brophy. The left wing haired towards the line and scored a try, unconverted. For the next 20 minutes, Ireland was subjected to heavy pressure. Jean Dupuy went clean through the Irish defence and touched down in an excellent position.
throwback Pierre Lacaz added the goal point. Neither team scored again. At no side, Ireland had beaten the champions and earned the congratulations of the rugby world. In 1959, another important Lions tour to New Zealand to taste defeat in the series 3 1. Now the crowd see some of the play that's made O'Reilly's reputation. With terrific speed, the Irish wing three quarter makes a bid for the New Zealand goal line but just can't get there. O'Reilly has the ball. He's streaking away. He throws a one handed to Scotland. They'll never stop now. Jackson has it. He beats McPhail. He beats Urban. Colton won't stop him and he's scored in the corner. Magnificent try that brings the score to 3 all, and the time is running out in the first half. Slow motion now shows Risman at his best. Mulligan sends him the ball. He moves round on the blind side, dodging Meade. He's racing up the line now, and they can't stop him. He sidesteps McPhail. Pickering can't catch him. Don Clark will be too late, and Risman has scored by a magnificent the first test, a win to New Zealand by 18-17 rekindled all the arguments about the value of a try compared to the value of a penalty. The Lions scored three superb tries but lost to six kicks by the awesome Don Clark. In 1961, another tour for the Springboks. 70,000 cheered and England, all in white, began their most formidable task of the season. Could they hold the so far unconquerable South Africans? Wales and Ireland both failed, but only by small margins. There was little in it for most of the first half until Springbok's wing forward, Doug Hopwood, took a pass from Carson, raced ahead and went over for the only try of the match. Benny from sale. The Barbars were awarded a Springbok head after becoming the first side in the British Isles to defeat them. Penny from sale. And there's Ace in trouble and more than quickly than he scores. The Springboks were devastating. They went on to beat the British Isles 3-0 on the Lions Tour of 1962. One of the 1962 Lions was Richard Sharp, on his day an outstanding back. Typical of his approach was this contender for try of the century against Scotland in 1963. The Welsh sides were going from strength to strength. They won the Triple Crown in 1965 and the Championship in 1966. Scotland kick off against Wales before the capacity crowd at Murrayfield. After kicking a penalty goal, Wales attack again, and S.J. Watkins scores a try. A brilliant fullback, T.G. Price, adds the goal points. So Wales lead 8-6 at half-time. Time's running out, and Wales put all they've got into a do-or-die attack. A line-out. The Flanethley forward, in our gale, crashes over the line. So Wales win 14-12. If they can beat Ireland, they'll win the Triple Crown for the first time in 13 years and the championship in 1966. England, playing left to right in this scene, had a tough afternoon ahead of them in a match against Wales at Twickenham. Triple crown winners last season, the Welsh looked a great side on paper, hard and skillful as ever, but well aware that on this ground, success generally eludes them. A Pathé cameraman on the line for ultra close-ups was unofficially fouled. Centre DK Jones had the England defence at sixes and sevens. Jones to Alan Past, and he scored a great try. The 60s will probably be remembered for the great All Blacks teams. On their 1963-64 tour, only Scotland prevented them recording a clean sweep. In 1965, New Zealand demanded that Maoris be included in future tours. They cancelled the forthcoming tour of South Africa. This was a watershed in the history of apartheid in rugby. In 1966, the Lions travelled to New Zealand to play for and lose for. This same side under Brian Lahore toured Britain in 1967 and remained undefeated. They demolished England 23-11. Meads got that ball nicely. Curtin took his eye off it. This is Rogers trying to give it to Taylor, but he hasn't. It's taken by Williams. Here's this Wellington flanker. Almost up to the England 25, McRae joining in, number 13 dribbling on. And this is Meads up there as well. Williams is there, number six, and it's a try for Dirk Whistle. 
A sudden breakaway there, and Bert, Bert Whistle has scored to put the New Zealanders ahead by eight points to nil. Then Scotland 14-3. Again Lahore, this is Meads on the charge, Grant goes down, but this is Gray, the prop forward, over the 25, beautifully out to McRae, McRae I think must score, and he has a magnificent try for McRae. Only the Barbars came close to defeating them, eventually going down 11-6. Dick's going to have to be quick. It may be a score, and it is by Lloyd. Lloyd has scored to put the Barbarians ahead by six points to three. Wilson on his own 25. Doesn't find that. Brian Lafort, he's got the man outside him. There he is, it's Curtin. Tony still is going to score. It's a wonderful try, and the New Zealanders have saved their unbeaten record. That was a brilliant counter-attack. The kicker, McCormick, and a great ovation for the All Blacks and for Tony Steele for this dramatic pullback from seeming defeat. McCormick, and that one's dead in the middle. The referee's whistle goes for no side, and the All Blacks have won a really magnificent victory because they were six points to three down with only about six or seven minutes to go. The French team of this era were the only Five Nations side who could live with the Welsh, and in 1967 they won the championship, and in 68 finally the Grand Slam. Ironically, this team was a forward-based unit, without the flair and style of the previous eras. In 1968, the Lions went down again in South Africa, losing three and drawing one. But as we move into the 70s, we find an era when Northern Hemisphere rugby would once more be respected throughout the world. This was due in the main to another of the great sides, the Welsh team of the 70s. Between 69 and 79, the Welsh won three Grand Slams, six outright championships and six Triple Crowns. In 1969, the Welsh team won the Five Nations. Memorably, Richards scored four against the English. So it was three all at half-time, with England playing into the wind on the resumption. They'd lost the advantage in the first half. Wales on the attack again. England weren't getting a look in. The Triple Crown and the International Championship came closer and closer as the Welsh lads opened up their lead even more. John added another three points. 14-3 and the crowd wild with excitement as the home team pulverised the visitors. Richard collected and headed for the line. It was all Wales. England had no reply to the bulldozing drive of the great Welsh side. Richard had scored yet again. England had gleaned another penalty, but Wales were ahead 25 points to six, and they weren't finished yet. Magnificent Richards added another three. With a conversion, it brought the Welsh score to 30. England put on three more penalty points, but they were small consolation. This Five Nations featured a victory for England against France, and one of the great tries of that era. Demonstrators faced a cordon of security staff as they prepared to greet the incoming Springbok rugby touring team from South Africa. The apartheid policy of South Africa includes all forms of sport, preventing black and white from playing together. In Britain in 1969-1970, anti-apartheid demonstration reached new levels. Welcoming group of fellow countrymen, the atmosphere at the airport was strained. The Springboks captain commented that they'd come to play rugby and not worry about politics. A spokesman for the demonstrators said he was sure that the South Africans knew they were going to be hounded everywhere they went. 25 matches are scheduled for the tour. And hounded they were. To Twickenham, the 5th of November, against Oxford University and a massive police presence. The Springboks' first venue had been kept secret until the last minute. But when they arrived to play Oxford University, the demonstrators were ready. The teams ran out to a mixed response. Cheers from the rugby enthusiasts, boos and whistles from the demonstrators. At a line of 200 policemen, 
Plus, a steel fence prevented any active interruptions. The game got underway. Oxford were beginning to pile on the pressure, and the South Africans were looking harassed. The famed Springboks were in trouble. Scrum time again, on and off the field. Now Oxford were going all out. Again, Heel kicked an easy goal. 6 3 to Oxford. The one demonstrator who managed to get on the pitch didn't fool anyone. As the second half got underway, it was obvious this was Oxford's game. The mighty Springboks were on the run. The day was Oxford, but the tour continued. Anti-apartheid demonstrators turned out in strength on the eve of the Scotland versus South Africa Rugby Union International. Police were out in strength around the ground to repel anti-apartheid pitch invaders. They made it plain that they were determined to do so. Back on the field, the no-score deadlock was broken by Visagi. The break in play was time for repairs all round. After the match, protesters demanded a public inquiry into police behaviour. But so far as the men on the field were concerned, there was a game to play. In the 75th minute, fullback Ian Smith proved his worth as a new cap when he burst into the line with perfect timing and went over. It was a great effort which won Scotland the match six points to three. After the final whistle, police swarmed onto the pitch. The Springboks tour is certainly bugged with trouble. Next month, they're scheduled to play on. Already there are ominous signs of trouble brewing there. Minute to go to half time. South Africa leading by a goal and a penalty goal to nil. The Springboks struggle to find their form on the tour, obviously unhappy and distracted by their reception. Bob Taylor broke, but it was unlucky, he slipped. This is Shackleton, tackled by Bates. Gives it inside to Starla Smith, over the 25. This is Bucknell, a great move by England. Lochter to fair brother, Lochter must score. Eight points to six, South Africa lead. Two yards from the Springboks line. Lochter beaten to it there by Devet. It's a try for England. The ball going loose. John Pullen picks up and goes over to score with Bob Taylor alongside it. Bob Hiller with the conversion attempt. Bob Hiller then. They lost to England, 11-8, and only drew with the Irish. It was probably only in the last two games of the tour that they showed what they were capable of. They drew with a strong Welsh side on a typical Welsh afternoon. Now Dupreya trying to work it clear. Davy de Villiers, a chance here, and it's a try for Nomis. That's into the space. There's a chance for Ian Hall. Down goes Nomis. This is 10 yards out from the South African line. Fed out by Barry Llewellyn. What a chance for Gareth Edwards. And in the final game, and probably the best of the tour, they beat the Barbars. Gareth Edwards using the narrow side, out to Duckham. My goodness, can't he move? Duckham inside H.O. de Villiers, this could be one of the tries of the season. De Villiers, lawless. Here's no miss on the overlap. Inside Jeffrey, knocked over by Mervyn Davis. This is Jennings, De Villiers. This is great stuff, De Villiers, and a wonderful try for Ellis. Stuart Gallagher got up well there. Edwards to John, Gibson, Spencer, Williams in the line. Spencer is through to the 25. There must be a chance for Alan Duggan. This is Duggan. What a score. Gareth Edwards to Barry John, Mike Gibson, tackled by Rue, booted on by Mike Lawless, back goes John on his own 25, tackled by Funda Merva, this is trailing, a great chance for the Stellenbosch Express, Funda Vart, what a try! This is Ellis from 
Jennings over the 25. He's got De Klerk inside him. But what a wonderful score by Jean Ellis. The riots during the British tour and again during the South African series in Australia in 1971 made future tours all but impossible. Later that same year, South Africa conceded and allowed three Maoris and a Samoan into the country, but as honorary whites. The coloured players had a point to prove and played accordingly. <laughs> 